Morning everyone. Um, my name's Sarah Wayland. Um, in the last uh, research meeting, uh, we were talking about ways in which you can increase your profile as an academic researcher and um, find ways in order to push out the research that you've conducted in terms of the papers that have, you've had published and think about new ways to increase your readership, which in turn increases your citation rate. So one of the examples that I'm going to talk about today is ways in which you can take a new paper and find new opportunities to be able to share it in a way that usually takes no more than maybe 15 to 20 minutes, but does have direct implications for how many times people come, view, read and consider the really hard work that you've done in getting a paper published. Now the focus that I'm going to talk about today is using Twitter. Really easy to set up a Twitter account, uh, lots of tutorials online that you can find, but really it's just a matter of setting up a profile, using the name that is your name, assigning where it is that you currently work, so being really clear that you're with uh, the University of New England or another university if you move on, and making sure that there's opportunities for you to develop, I guess, um, some um, spaces for you to talk about what's meaning for you in your research area, connect with other like-minded researchers or um, other events that are happening nationally or internationally. But really, it's just a matter of joining the conversation. What we often find is that there's spaces at conferences, in breakout areas, over coffee and tea, to talk and connect with other people that do similar work that we do. But after COVID, there's been really limited opportunities to be in the same room as others. Twitter and other social media sites give you an opportunity to connect, to be at the forefront and to be able to see what it is that people are discussing and add to the conversation. My top tip is, you know, I've been on Twitter since it began, so probably 10 or 11 years. Throughout my PhD, I was pretty quiet on there. I just spent a lot of time looking at what people were sharing, thinking about the ways in which um, I might shape or um, conduct my research, noticing um, events that were happening around my research area, which is missing persons. And then once I got my doctor title, um, I made sure that I changed my name on Twitter to be really clear about um, the fact that I had a PhD. And then I started to join in some conversations. Now, a lot of people talk about social media in the way that, you know, that there's um, trolls online, that there are people that push back or say inappropriate things. And I must admit, in all of my years on Twitter, I think I've blocked like two people who've said something that's just made, mild, made me mildly uncomfortable. It should be pointed out that I do know some academics um, dependent on their research area sometimes do get a bit of a pushback from sometimes conservative people online, sometimes trolls. When you make political statements, you also have to be, um, I guess, prepared for the fact that other people will disagree with you. But in the space that I work in, missing persons and suicide prevention, I very rarely had anybody um, that has said something where I've either had to remove the tweet or I've had to block my contact with them. I have a relatively small Twitter um, audience. Um, I have probably two or two and a half thousand followers. Um, it's taken 10 or 11 years for me to curate that idea of who I connect with on Twitter which is just a matter of following and unfollowing people. So don't worry too much about who you follow or who follows you on Twitter, but about how you shape your own conversation and find your own researcher voice on social media. Now, one of the examples that I wanna talk about today is how you take a publication and you provide opportunities for people to understand your paper. Now, traditionally, um, you know, you'd usually find that people will find your papers when they're accessing databases, when they search for certain keywords that you have attached to your publication. They might see it on ResearchGate, if you use ResearchGate, Academia, if you use that platform, Google Scholar. There's lots of places for people to access your written material, but they have to choose to go and look for it. Whereas on Twitter, you're almost turning it around the other day. You're presenting it to people and giving them an opportunity to understand what you've published. So the example that I've got here that I'm going to share today is about taking a paper. I've chosen just the one that's most recently published 
Um, so that was in April of this year. And, showing, and I'll be able to show you how I took that one paper and um, provided an opportunity to pull it apart into some meaningful areas. Now, at the end of my tweet thread, so I'm kind of going a little bit around in a circle here, was a link to, I'm just gonna open this in a new tab, was a link to the actual paper itself. Now, this is an open access paper in the International Journal for Environmental Research and Public Health. Not all journal papers that you publish are open access, so make sure you consider that when you're putting that information up on ResearchGate. Now, the purpose of this paper, and it was a paper that I actually worked on for most of last year um, with a, an old uh, University of New England researcher, I don't mean old in age, I mean she used to work here, um, Dr. Kathy Mackay, who's now working for the NHS Trust in um, London as part of some work that she does with Liverpool, the University of Liverpool in the UK. So this was some work that she approached me to help her with, which was around a Twitter analysis of the ways in which people talked about the initiative of Clap for Carers. It was hashtag Clap for Carers. That was when the UK, during their first lockdown, decided to have a nightly opportunity for people to come to their front door and clap for NHS workers to demonstrate their gratitude in terms of how they were, were responding to the pandemic. What we did was we reviewed all of the tweets around hashtag clap for carers. And we, what we did was try and understand through content analysis what these tweets were saying in terms of positive and negative sentiments. We looked at the themes around how initially people were happy to have a sense of community on Twitter in terms of talking about the pandemic, but that the longer the lockdown happened, the longer the social, emotional and mental health implications of the pandemic started to be realised and the lack of political leadership um, in terms of the UK, how that shaped the way that Clap for Carers initially became a positive focus and then move to something that was quite explosive on Twitter. So that's the paper itself. But what we did was we thought about, well, what information would people like to understand about this paper? Because let's face it, when you're faced with a new paper, sometimes you don't have time to read the whole thing. You might read the abstract, you might read the results, you might only focus on the methodology because you're wanting to rec replicate a similar study. So we pulled out the kind of six core areas that might relate to how people understand um, what our results were from this study. So I always start off with a very broad um, statement on Twitter and I create what's called a thread. So I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So here we have um, just a notification that says, A, we've got a new publication out there, nothing like a bit of PR as a researcher. A new publication, We've tagged the journal, so make sure you know, I do all of this in Word before I put it over to Twitter. Make sure you know, know the Twitter handle of the journal publication. The name of the paper, thinking about the hashtags that might bring people to reading things, because it's not just people following your profile that will read things that you share on Twitter, it's people following certain hashtags. So you can see here we had COVID-19 as a hashtag, we had health, we had workforce, we also use the term Twitter to kind of capture people's attention and the NHS, which is a significant um, hashtag on Twitter in terms of something that's often, often trending. We then also identified who our co-authors were. So first author, Kathy Mackay, myself as second author. Third, I should state this here is actually my husband, who's a data analyst and helped us with the Twitter analysis. Um, we were locked down here in Sydney as well, and he was a bit bored, so I used his data skills um, and his affiliation with the University of Technology. And then our final author, um, our final two authors, Jane and Ias, both of them did, aren't on Twitter, but we made sure that we named them. And then acknowledged the institutions that we worked for. So Kathy's institution, Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, and of course, Health at UNE. So that was the opening kind of introduction. I also acknowledged here how many tweets were um, going to be shared in relation to this paper. So there were eight tweets in total. So I published that. And then what you'll find at the bottom of that first tweet 
is um, an opportunity where it says add another tweet to this thread. I click that and I copied and pasted the next tweet over. You can see here that I've named that two of eight so that people are following. So what I did initially was I provided an overview about the fact that we took over 120,000 tweets about the ways in which Clap for Carers was shared and the, the types of tweets that were shared in relation to this kind of performative initiative. We took a screenshot of the section in terms of what it is that we uncovered so that people were able to have a look at an image to get a sense of what it is that we've included in the paper. Then we moved on to thinking about, well, what changed over time with these tweets? This became our third of eight tweets. So as time moved on, people started to talk about those frustrations. It's kind of like when you think about all of the narratives around the lockdown. Initially, people talked about, you know, loving having more time at home. I'm learning to bake bread. I'm finishing off those craft projects I started and never finished. I'm um, doing more gardening than I ever had before. So in the beginning, people started to talk about the fact that they were really grateful for the NHS. Then people started to notice, you know what? There's limited PPE for NHS workers. So that kind of initial feel good response started to change. Then there was a sense that the NHS was kind of struggling under the weight of the pandemic. So the tweet that we moved on from there talked about a, almost like a timeline approach of what our results said. That as the pandemic escalated, Twitter users shared ways in which they could practically support the NHS. And then people started to use it as a political tool. They started to push back for the ways in which they could save the NHS. So there was a whole sense of the NHS being a cultural touchstone for people in the UK, almost like don't you dare allow the NHS to fail, uh, a kind of call to action for the political leaders. What we found over the two month period that we were looking, and this um, was encapsulated in our next tweet, that by May of that year, Clap for Carers was very much a space of sharing anger and frustration about the amount of NHS workers that were dying and the emotional impact on the health workforce. We also started to find that there was lower engagement or use of the term Clap for Carers. So then we tried to understand in our discussion section, so this moved on to our sixth tweet in the thread here. And this is just following the trajectory of the paper. There was no new information shared. It was just taking that initial paper that I showed you up here and then pulling it apart into sections to be able to understand, well, what is it that's being offered here? What can we demonstrate to our readers in terms of what they'll learn if they go over to our paper? So we wanted, <clears throat> We wanted to understand, well, you know what, if social media is being used significantly, so we said before over 123,000 tweets using that term, what does it do in terms of giving people a voice during a pandemic when people are traditionally silenced? We thought about the ways in which the tweets demonstrated a sense of uncertainty or ambiguity of people that were stuck at home, people that were frightened of the virus, people that were worried about dying, people that wanted to make sure that the NHS was there in case they needed it, and about what happens to that sense of fatigue of that hypervigilance associated with the pandemic. We then talked about, well, what were the outcomes of this paper? About the fact that initially, when we um, focus on initiatives, you might think back to in Australia, uh, you know, some of the initiatives we might have shared, there was a cricketer that was, um, that was killed a number of years back and the hashtag was put your bats out for that person. That kind of performative nature of, <clears throat> you know, situational grief, community based trauma about how that sometimes that there's problems associated with the symbolism of the social media initiatives that we start up. That it gives people something to do in the beginning, but then people recognize over time that it's not actually changing the situation and that there needed to be more emphasis on how to support the workforce rather than just symbolically or tokenistically suggesting that by coming outside and clapping for carers, that that was in some ways going to help the nurses and the doctors responding to the pandemic. And then finally, our tweet brought people back 
to the place where they could read the paper themselves. So we linked to ResearchGate and then we thought about the ways in which people could then take that initiative and think about what they wanted to do next. So you can see here, and um, Miff and I have done this on a number of papers. You can look back in either of our Twitter threads. I think we've done it on our last four or five papers that have been published over the last year. It also means that you're able to check the analytics. So when I say that, we're thinking about what the tweet activity is going to tell us. So underneath any tweet that you share, you can click on analytics and it's going to tell you how many times people have viewed the information that you shared. So you can see that that one tweet alone had almost 300 people reading it. Now, you might think that that's not a lot, but the reality is some of the journal papers that we write often only have six or seven people reading them in their lifetime if we're writing about very niche areas. You can see a little bit earlier up, so that analytic um, information I just shared of 300 was on one of the tweets embedded in the thread, that the original thread where we had all of our links to other people and some clarity about what the paper was about, was viewed by over 2,000 people. So you can see that for that 20 minutes of time sharing your paper, you've at least provided an opportunity to get it in front of people that might never have known that it existed. So what then we're able to do is also think about from an analytics perspective in ResearchGate is that we can see if we do all of that work, then who actually went on and read? If you think about the average amount being five or six or seven people completely reading a paper, you can see here that 47 people have actually gone on to read that paper. So it means that it's actually a good use of your time. So I hope that that's been helpful. I'm more than happy to help people um, by having a look at their papers and suggesting how you might pull it into four or five or six tweets to be able to share. The social media team at um, Health UNE are always really happy to retweet anything that you tweet. Make sure you're following them so that they can retweet you. You can always talk to the media team as well about the ways in which they might be able to use um, the UNE blog to be able to promote any new research that you've conducted. And this is not about, you know, kind of uh, talking up for yourself or being up yourself in terms of sharing information. It's taking the really hard work that we do behind the scenes all of the time and making sure that any person that actually wants to read this knows that it exists. It's about sharing across our platforms for the greater good because all of the work that we do in health in some ways is going to benefit the community. So yeah, um, I think that that's probably all I wanted to say there. I'll stop sharing that for the minute. And um, please make sure that you get in touch if you have any other questions about using social media and sharing your new publications. Thanks.